Welcome to the Speaking Podcast. You can find all my episodes on speakingpodcast.com. I'm also on BitChute and YouTube. You'll find the links in the podcast description. I'm also a podcasting coach. I've got four other podcasts, The Learn Polish, The Meditation, The Crypto, and The Awakening, Exposing Fraud and Corruption. You'll find everything on bio.link forward slash podcaster. Today, my guest, and I'll actually mention this because I normally get bombarded with requests to come on my podcast. I've actually asked this person to be on my podcast, and I'm going to explain why. High stakes performance coach, professional speaker, a voiceover artist, award winning performer, and also an author. Please welcome John Watkiss. Did I pronounce your surname correctly? You got it right, Roy. Thank you so much. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. So I know you're not doing that much, but I mean, <laughs> you might let people know. <laughs> You might let people know a bit more about John. To start with, I'll say that I'm a voiceover artist and I prefer working in the e-learning space, the narration, as well as being a professional speaker. I started speaking back in 1996, originally from Canada. I was also the first black male to be a professional member of the Canadian Association of Professional Speakers. I now am living in the warmth of sunny Florida, but before I left Canada, I also performed as the first Canadian-born actor to play Mufasa in the Disney musical, The Lion King. I'm an author of a book called Speaking Notes. It's the eight essential elements to make your speech music to their ears. It's the only book that shows you how to take the composition of a song and apply it to a speech so that your audience remembers, repeats, and responds to what you say. And I also coach speakers, or professionals, I should say, because they're not all necessarily speakers, but I coach professionals for high stake situations where they have to give a presentation or a pitch or do an interview, and there's only one shot at winning. Yeah, excellent, excellent. I know there's a lot we can delve into, but uh, first I'd like to know, how did you get speaking when you were younger? What way did it all come about? I was working for a company that now wouldn't be able to operate. It was called Columbia House. And what Columbia House did is we would mail customers VHS tapes and CDs and records because there were people who couldn't have access to a store. So they ordered their music through the mail. But when I was working for that company, they sent me to a customer service seminar. I still remember the date. It was June 23rd, 1994. Darcel Carrington was the presenter that day and he was teaching how to deliver exceptional customer service. And I remember sitting there thinking to myself, that's what I want to do with my life. And it was two years later when Fred Pryor's seminars came back to Toronto looking for seminar leaders to teach their workshops. Now, Fred Pryor seminars is now Fred Pryor career track and they're the largest seminar company in the world. In fact, I had the opportunity to travel to England and Wales with Fred Pryor seminars. So I auditioned for them. They took me into a room, put me in front of a video camera with one person. I auditioned. They took me through their training course. And over the course of, I want to say, four years, when I initially started with them, because I took a break and went back, I taught over 20 courses. And it would be nine to four. Start the course at nine, end the course at four, pack everything up in your car, drive to the next city, do it again five days in a row, go back home for the weekend, and the next week it started all over again. So I got in a lot of experience working with Fred Pryor seminars. But I'd say that's very tiring as well when you're actually, you know, because same with, I suppose, depending, because in the current situation, a lot of people are actually delighted that they were doing a lot of their speeches on Zoom instead of traveling. But for something like that, where you're you're basically, because you kind of get grounded in, you know, you, you mentioned before we started recording, you're, you've done your training, and I like doing that as well. But I found when you're moving around, trying to get a routine is very hard. Did you find that? It was hard to stay grounded when you're kind of doing a lot of that. I don't know that it was hard to stay grounded. I could because I did have my routine on the road and it was listening to a lot of we had cassettes at the time. There were cassettes in cars. So when I drove from one city to the next, I would just play a cassette and I would listen to it and iron my clothes when I got to or press my clothes when I got to the hotel. And then the next morning it was up at a specific time 
always had breakfast by myself, did my vocal warm-ups, hot water, lemon and honey, and into the room. So that actually became my routine. It was, it was when I got home that I would think, now what do I do? <laughs> but on the road, you, you develop that routine. Brilliant, brilliant. So, I mean, you mentioned, you know, the hot water and lemon. What are the kind of warm-ups have you done? And, I mean, you've obviously coached a lot of people. Have you seen other people do? Absolutely. And it's a benefit to have a background in both the performing arts and the speaking because you draw from what singers would do and theater arts, theater arts as well, to get those warm-ups. So what I do with the lips, <clears throat> Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled pepper. Sally sells seashells by the seashore. Rubber baby buggy bumper. Toy boat, toy boat, toy boat. So when they say to me, can you please do a mic check? That's what I do rather than going one, two, three. Excellent. I'm always warming up the voice because if you don't, it gets stuck. You don't have as much of a range. So I'm warming it up. I'm doing breathing exercises and that helps to reduce nervousness as well. Brilliant, brilliant. So I know that uh, you've helped kind of high performance athletes and even government uh, officials prepare speeches. So I suppose when you're actually working with, with even say a politician or whatever, what, 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 what's the best tips for actually making sure that they kind of connect with you that they actually deliver what you're trying to do because in your head you've got a certain way that this should be done and not everybody can actually do that you've hit it on the head very often when we prepare a speech for someone else we're ex we're thinking about how we would do it and then when you give it to them it's completely different and that just takes a while to get used to you then what, what i would do is i would try and match their pace of speech so I would listen closely to how do they speak. And then when I was preparing their speech, I would read it at their pace, try and imitate their voice so that I could get as much of them as possible. And then recognizing what they struggle with in terms of word usage. Do, do they like to use big words? Do they have a longer pace? It was so draining. I have to say this, I no longer write speeches for people <laughs> because it really requires you to take on that person's complete essence to do it justice. And then what I try to do rather than say, do it this way or do it that way, I'll say, what emotion do you want people to feel during that? And then once they deliver that emotion, I say, okay, now say it with that emotion. That helps them to connect to it. Excellent. I suppose it's the same with if you're trying to incorporate humor, because some people, it, they're just not comfortable with that. Absolutely. It was amazing to see when we went to the Zoom platform, professional speakers who have been speakers forever, and they radiate from the stage, got onto Zoom and looked like this. <laughs> because they had never just been in front of a camera and now there's no audience giving them the energy back and they don't know what to do. <laughs> it was a, it, it evened out the playing field. I have to say that for those who were not used to being in front of the camera. Excellent. And have you any kind of other tips for kind of, whether it's Zoom or Google Meets, there's a few different ones, but, you know, because I know that people have kind of upped their game definitely, because I know at the start when it happened, as you mentioned, I've come across a lot of people doing that with the podcast and I kind of had the experience of doing it anyways. And, you know, I, I found it funny, but like, have you tips that you can give people that can improve it? Absolutely. And it's something that we would do in voiceover. Get a little picture of someone that you like or your pet, whatever it is, put it right near the lens and talk to that picture. And that, that way you have at least some something that you're giving energy to as opposed to just the cold lens. Excellent, excellent. So with, with the coaching, like, because I... A lot of the listeners, some are aspiring to be speakers, but I know that there's a lot of kind of professional speakers, which I like because they're always trying to improve and just pick up different tips. What's the kind of common things that you kind of spot as you're coaching? What I 
notice most often is when it comes to a speech, the speaker is getting into the weeds. When I say getting into the weeds, they're going way too deep with the information and giving far too much detail. When we're giving a presentation, especially one that is short, you want people to remember as much as they can. And the only way they're going to remember is, is if you minimize the details and expand on the concept. So what pictures can you paint? What analogies can you use? Because otherwise we get so deep into the detail, the, the audience gets lost. And it's not like reading a book. If you get lost, you can't go back and see what they that you just read. So you're always trying to follow the speaker and most speakers are giving too much detail and it doesn't engage or keep the audience on track. That's the second aspect I would say is also a big mistake. When we speak, we wanna give people information. Before they're ready to absorb the information, we have to prepare them. Just like you would prepare soil before you put a seed in. Well, how do you prepare an audience? You either provide them with a scenario or, or ask them with a question that will make them wanna hear what comes next. And most speakers just wanna tell you what comes next. Here's the information you need to know, but they don't necessarily know why it's important to listen to it. So a big mistake is just giving the information without providing context or reason why they should listen a little bit closer. One thing I've noticed is a lot of people are actually very uncomfortable with the applause. They just want to get off stage and you can see the relief, you know, just leaving their body. And I've seen other people, they just, it's like they just suck in the energy. So, I mean, you've obviously witnessed that as well. Absolutely. And I have given that particular piece of instruction to many speakers. Say, like, let them enjoy your presence when they're giving you applause. They're, they're saying how much they appreciate you. Wait until they're done before you take off. It is amazing to see how quickly people want to get off that stage or in front, in front of that audience. And uh, you mentioned uh, Mustafa, I believe, is the the, the role that uh, Mufasa. You, Muf yeah, <laughs> I have Mufasa, my, but yeah. I checked it. So that's the line for those. That, but I mean that that's a, a major uh, role that you've got. So you might just kind of talk a bit about that, how that came about. That was one of those serendipitous moments. I was coming back from speaking. I was still speaking full time for Fred Pryor. I was on an airplane. I can't remember from which city, and I opened up the newspaper. The ad said singers wanted for The Lion King. And what they wanted was for you to do 16 bars a cappella of a song. Now that means without music. I do karaoke or I did karaoke on the road all the time when I was traveling. And I do have a background in, I had a background in art school. I was a theater arts major. They kicked me out, but I was a theater arts major. Anyhow, I figured, you know what? My karaoke is pretty good let me go audition for the show. And when I arrived at the audition, they said to me, do you have your sheet music? Now it said in the ad a cappella, so I didn't bring any sheet music, but there were hundreds of people auditioning that day. And that meant I had three hours before my audition. So I went to the music store. I bought the music for I Just Called to Say I Love You, which was my go-to karaoke song. And I went back. I auditioned and they gave me a script and it said Mufasa. And I went for a few callbacks and eventually got into the show. So it wasn't as if I was searching for this opportunity or I had auditioned for so many shows. It was pretty much the equivalent of walking off the street and going into a pro athlete's audition or tryout and, and being put on the team. It's, it was one of the most fascinating experiences I have ever had. But I suppose all all them days that you were actually going from one place to the next in the car for you know all your preparation is the reason that you had the you know the confidence as well to to, to come across. So not fantastic, fantastic. Absolutely, and the more you stand on a stage or the more you stand in front of a group, whether it's Toastmasters or whether it's your local meeting, the more you do it, the more confident you will become, and then in those high stakes situations, you're ready to perform. 
Excellent. And like I know that I think it was your one of the websites that I was looking just gone through all the different uh, things that you've got, like the voiceover that you do for commercials, which is very good. But I suppose some people aspire to do that. So you might kind of talk about the pros and cons and things to watch out for if you're actually doing a voiceover on a commercial. The voiceover, a lot of people are told, hey, you have a great voice. You should do voiceover. And as much as that helps, the most important part of voiceover is being able to act. It's, it's really called voice acting. So can you, can you add emotion? Can you change up your voice? Because right now, a lot of the reads say we don't want a radio announcer style. Can you be conversational in your read? And I, I would urge everyone who thinks about being a voice actor to read out loud daily. Pick up a newspaper, look at your iPad or whatever, and read out loud every day. Because that is the key to voice acting, is being able to look at the script and then interpret it different ways. So I can read a line, why are you coming? Why are you coming? Why are you coming? But it's based on what the director is asking you for. And so they'll say, here is the type of read we want. And you have to interpret that and go, which also means be willing to keep auditioning. Because even if you don't get picked for a particular piece or commercial, that producer may be thinking, this is not where the voice fits, but I know another project where it will. So even though you think you're auditioning for that particular piece, you may be auditioning for something else down the road as well. And I suppose with that, when you are auditioning, it's always to stay in a positive emotion because even if they say, sorry, you don't get that. If you throw a strap, which some people, they just can't control their emotions. They get, they they walk out narky or, or give a little, whereas if you're respectful and professional, I just say, look, I appreciate the opportunity anyway. At the end of the day, they want to work with somebody that they, they respect and respects them. Absolutely. That extra part that doesn't have anything to do with your talent, <laughs> your attitude, your point of view, the way you behave plays a large part because it's, you can be talented beyond means, but if people don't like working with you, you'll find very often that you are left out in the cold. Excellent. So how do you make your speech sound like music? When I think about music, I think about the most important part, or at least the central part of music, and that is the chorus. It's the part we sing over and over and over again. It's what the song is all about. And when we do a presentation, when we give a speech, we should have a chorus. We should be able to have people walk away from that speech and when someone says what did Roy talk about they can tell you specifically in a succinct sentence this is what he spoke about today now, when I came up with this concept it was actually I had written a speech for a client and she sent me back an email saying how well the speech went and then at the end of the email she said P.S. do you play a musical instrument and this was early in 2000. The internet was new. Google was not something you did all the time, just research people. So I thought, why does she want to know that? And I responded to her saying, why are you asking this question? And her response was that a long time ago, someone told her that if you're going to hire a speechwriter, make sure that person is musical because a speech is meant to be listened to and not read. And as a result, it needs to have movement and highs and quiet parts and rhythm. And she said when she read the speech that I had written for her, she said to her husband, I bet you John is musical. I thought that's interesting because I, I, I never analyzed how I did what I did. I simply wrote the speeches that sounded good to me. But I thought, is it because I'm using my musical background? And everyone in my family is musical, right down from my grandmother who 99 years, 360 days old, she lived to, played the harmonica in her 90s. My uncle, my aunt, everybody, musical. But I'm still thinking, 
but am I doing this to write speeches? And, and that's when I went and started analyzing how you compose a song and then how you compose a speech and what were the greatest speeches in history. And that's when I found eight elements from music that were also in speeches. There's your chorus, the, the main part of the song, your verses, and your verses, if you think about them in music, they tell the story of the chorus. The chorus tells you what it's about. The verse gives you a little bit more clarity. Most popular songs have a hook. It's that part of the song that you repeat over and over again. So what, Sweet Caroline, ba ba ba. You can guarantee people are going to come. And out I've with... actually seen you <laughs> on one of your videos, and everybody in the audience. And I mean, I've seen that as well when people kind of say something like that it's there are some songs that it's just built into us. It's and that's called the hook, and those are also in speeches. We shall fight on the beaches, or ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Give me liberty or give me death. We have heard statements over time that we repeat. That's the hook. It stays in your brain. So if, if you want people to remember and repeat your speech, what's your hook? What's your line? There are pre-courses in between a verse and a chorus or the chorus and the verse in a song. There's that little musical piece that lets you know you're moving from one place to the other. That's a pre-chorus. It just says that I'm making a transition and a good speech has transitions that move you along. I like to compare them to breadcrumbs that you follow so that you're able to know where you were and where you're going next. Mood is an element of music that we should always be considering in our speeches. We all have a favorite song. In fact, it's a song that we say, it's my song. You can be in the midst of any activity. It starts playing you. Whoa, shh, 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 they're playing my song. Why? Because of the mood it puts us in. It, it may take us back decades. Well, every speech also has to have a mood. What do you want people to feel? Because we act based on how we feel. And the mood, just like in a song, it's set right off the beginning. You only have to hear a few notes from your favorite song to know that it's about to play. You want to set the proper mood at the beginning of a speech too. Then you have rhythm. Are you using short sentences? Are you using long sentences? Are you pausing in between? <laughs> All of this accounts for rhythm. The biggest mistake I'll say that speakers make when it comes to rhythm is that they try to cram in 10 minutes of information in a five minute time span and just speak very quickly the whole time. When you really should be pausing and speeding up sometimes, then slowing down. Next is expression. And we use a lot of the musical expression terms in our regular language. So it came to a crescendo. All that means is it got louder or staccato. Why did you do that? separating words, those are all expression marks that you would put on a musical piece in order to tell you how to play the note. And there's one called diminuendo. Crescendo is getting louder, diminuendo is getting quiet. And this is one of the areas we miss out on because if I'm gonna tell you something juicy, something that is really important, we could lean in and go really quiet. Th that's part of expression. But very often when we're trying to tell our points and we want to be motivational, we're telling it at the top of our lungs. And that can get you very tired. So expression is just how do you change it up in terms of volume, in terms of pitch, in terms of hitting each word. And then the last part that makes it sound like music is the bridge. And the bridge is the arc that takes you to the end of the song. It lets you know that you're about to be finished. I only think you need to incorporate five of those to key in on it. And the, the rhythm and the expression are advanced. But if you have your chorus, your verse, your pre-choruses, and then your close or your bridge, you'd be pretty successful. If you can get a hook in, even better. 
Excellent, love it. And I know you've uh, you've spoke, I, I believe, in four continents, lots of different countries. Kind of, what have you learned? Because sometimes people think, yeah, I'll just replicate this in the the other places, and it kind of uh, <laughs> it seems to be a learning curve. So I'd like to know your take on that one. Ooh, I just got back from Saudi Arabia. I was there a few months ago, and I was unsure because of reading. I, I did read about the culture ahead of time, and I was unsure exactly how to approach it because there was also a different language. Even though the participants spoke in English, I, I had to ease in for the first couple days. But the biggest lesson I received was when I visited London back in 1997, I believe. And I was teaching a presentation skills course and giving information based on what would happen in the US. So for example, in the US, we have consistent or constant commercials. Whereas I mentioned that in the session in, in London and someone wrote on my evaluation form, when you go to a different country, you should study the culture before making making these statements. We don't have commercials every two minutes. It, it was, and of course it was hard to, to stomach, but it was a great lesson. <laughs> understand the culture and what is different from where you are. And you need to, to do this with every audience, but especially when you're jumping from continent to continent, you had better learn <laughs> what their norms are before trying to state what happens or, or going back to what you're used to. Completely different worlds. Excellent. So. I know, like say the coaching, the speaking, and say it, it, like the the voiceover as well. Maybe you like, I I believe you've got two or three different companies. Like, what's your reasoning behind that? And do you recommend people because sometimes people put everything under the one umbrella, and I just know from property I didn't do that and it saved me. It, it, and I'm just curious, what's your reasoning behind that? I wish I had reasoning. <laughs> I, I am what I like to call an artistpreneur. I have a business side, I have an entrepreneurial side, and I have my creative side. And the creative side doesn't necessarily have a rhyme or reason. And so I follow the flow that I'm in. And the the voiceover and the performing are elements that I enjoy doing and I'm growing, my speaking I've been doing for decades now. And so that is a different revenue stream. I'm actually bringing them together. And I haven't completed the process yet, but I am working on combining the speaking and the singing in a conference type setting. But I, I wish I could say I had a reasoning for what I did. It, it felt right at the time. <laughs> Well, I can, and I you mean, asked why do I suggest anyone else do what I do? <laughs> if you have a strong stomach. <laughs> well, I suppose it's not one that there's many kind of court cases for, whereas property is. So, you know, I understand it with some businesses because you don't want everything to kind of knock down the rest of them. But in that kind of situation, I, you know, I don't see the audience members <laughs> taking you to court because they didn't like what you said. You know? Yes. And, and and also I will say this uh, for tax benefits and I know different places have, but I, if I set them up differently, what the business that's growing can still operate at a loss. I hope no one is, is watching who's going to now start auditing my, my taxes, but <laughs> there is that benefit. Definitely. And just finally with the, with the book, you might just kind of touch on what exactly you're covering in the book. The book covers the eight essential elements. I take you through what each element is, so the, the ones that I just described now, but then there's a, a space for you to actually create your own speech. But whether you have one now, you can use it as a mirror against the elements that are in the book. And then there are also historical speech examples because there's one to, to show theory, but then when you can show for actual speeches, that have been made that follow these premises, it makes it easier to now replicate it, not copy, but replicate it using your own. So the book walks you through those eight elements so that you are able to you make your speech sound like music. 
Brilliant. And it's something that I'm curious uh, as well as with the social media, because there's a minefield out there. What's your kind of go to and what, what you feel serves you best? I wish I was better on social media. Now, LinkedIn is really the, if you're looking business wise, LinkedIn is the best place to be. I need to utilize it more. I am by nature an introvert. And as a result, I'll get on the stage, I'll do what I have to do, and then I come back to my cave. So it, it is a challenge for me to continually put myself on social media platform. But LinkedIn definitely yields a lot of benefits. I've had clients who see an article or watch a video, and I get connected through them. That's the only platform that has happened on. There is an audio-only platform. And it's called Clubhouse. Initially, when it came out, and it, it really expanded during COVID, and once we started to get back out and in, into physical places again, it's gone down. But that was a wonderful client-generating tool for me, even though that's not what I wanted it to be. I got into rooms on Clubhouse. I held sessions. I helped people with presentations. I gave tips. And people would say, I would love for you to coach me. So I would say those two have been my biggest winners in terms of social media. First LinkedIn, then, then Clubhouse. And I'm still on Instagram and Facebook, but I just put pictures of my pancakes because I make gourmet pancakes and I put them on every week or as often as I make them or eat them. Excellent. And now you mentioned people kind of when they came on Zoom with the, I call it like the dazzled rabbit looked like, you know, what they're just, when I went on Clubhouse first, even though I had done lots of speeches in Toastmasters and had done a lot of um, live Zoom calls, because I do loads of uh, live calls as well. I got so nervous because <laughs> it was a different platform. <laughs> it took me about four or five times before I started speaking to just kind of relax. And I, I was beating myself up. It's like, why? <laughs> they can't even see me. I just <laughs> chose it. With, like, it's strange how these things happen to us. Fear is an interesting element and our brain plays tricks on us. I will tell you that the first time I went on stage with Mufasa, I, because I was the understudy, I was still in the show every night for six months before I finally got on stage and performed. So you would think that when they said, hey, it's your turn to do Mufasa, hey, I had been on stage every night, no big deal. That first night, they nearly didn't get me on stage. <laughs> I literally said to Topaz backstage, as soon as the shout went out, I can't do this. And it, it was, I've never felt fear like that, but why? I've been doing this show for months. So yes, sometimes fear grips us, whether it's on the phone, on Zoom, it is a part of what happens. And it, it didn't happen again after that. But I think when we go back to the to the well, so to speak, when we just keep repeating the pattern, the confidence level increases. So whether it's the clubhouse or it's Zoom or Facebook Live, whatever it is, if you're feeling that fear, go back, <laughs> do, do it again. It, it will start to go down. Yeah, face the fear and it dissipates, definitely. So, yes. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. So you might let people know how they can get in contact with you, John. Absolutely. I am John Watkiss pretty much everywhere you can find. So my website is www.johnwatkiss.com. And you can find me on Instagram, John Watkiss. Facebook should be John Watkiss as well. I may actually have two there. Twitter, John Watkiss, LinkedIn. <laughs> So all usually all one word, but I'm pretty easy to find on my social media chat channels. Excellent. I'll make sure I'll include the audio and the video. Thank you very much, John. Roy, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. So that's all for the Speaking Podcast. You'll find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com. As mentioned, we're on Pitch and YouTube. You'll find my other four podcasts, as well as the coaching on bio.link forward slash podcaster. Sure to give us a thumbs up, five-star rating. Really helps. Until next week, take care.